today we will have a, a number of examples because we have a, you know, called people that have, are working on this. And the first one is in fact a promise of a uh, world heritage. I think she comes from, from a school that has produced more world heritage experts since, yeah. since it exists than all the others that existed before. You know? <laughs> so you're a, you're a multi expert multiplier of world heritage. This is Alison, Alison Thompson from? Uh, New York. New York. The the State Party of New York. <laughs> <coughs> now, Alison has um, studied in Brandeis University and so on, um, library and information science, which is very good. So she knows how to read and write. This is already a good, good point. Um, and then she ended up uh, in uh, Cottbus, where she met, of course, all the other experts. But she has a very uh, interesting approach, which you will uh, see immediately, because she talks about sports. And uh, I really thank you for this, because UNESCO you know, has, a, it, although sports exist at UNESCO, you know, we have the anti-doping uh, uh, convention, you know, it's, 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 it's in, in UNESCO, people don't know that, but it is at UNESCO. Um, so sport exists in the social science uh, say branch of, of, of UNESCO, but really is not more than that. And uh, although it's important, it's a, it's a compartment, very technical compartment. What else? Sport is very important, I think you will tell us about, um, because it's a very integral part of society, and especially when you talk to the youth, as we know. We have a lot of sport people in the, in the ambassador, goodwill ambassador, Schumacher is a, is a, is a, is a goodwill ambassador, and, and some others. And sometimes we try to have them on board, but very often they're taken by others, because they're very popular. So now, Alison, come here and uh, tell us a little bit more. I think uh, this is an area that we certainly have to consider and explore further in the future. Yes, I, just, I want to thank Professor Albert quickly for this opportunity and um, for everyone for showing up and supporting the symposium so far. Um, so as part of the pre-planning for the symposium, we were tasked, uh, our group, with trying to find ways to go beyond the current discourse of um, sustainable development in relation to heritage. And so first we kind of thought, is there a need to go beyond? Should we just continue the way that we have been? Um, and I think most of us are here because we believe that there is somewhere to go and there are more ideas. So in terms of my research, kind of from the beginning, I knew the direction I wanted to go in. Um, but first I needed to figure out why this was necessary. And so how I saw it is that there are three main problems currently with the discourse of heritage and sustainability. And first and foremost um, is that most of the current trends are economic based. So while tourism is a huge driver of sustainability, it's also a predominantly Western concept. So while this might sustain sites in large European cities or um, frequently visited places, if we were to go to a small site in Africa or the Middle East, uh, they can't really rely on money from tourists on a regular basis. And second, although it is very important, uh, most sustainable development programs within UNESCO focus on the tangible. So this too is also a very Western concept because it places emphasis on the monuments and other physical objects, um, which is far less common in the Southern Hemisphere. And even in the US, we were kind of discussing that, yes, we have the Statue of Liberty, but most of our kind of heritage, people would say, is you know, freedom or democracy and things that you, know, you can't really grasp. Um, and furthermore, so if we uh, want to focus on the tangible and um, neglect the intangible, I think the value of the tangible sites begins to disappear because without the human concept, the sites are just um, physical manifestations of the bygone times. And lastly, there is a generational imbalance. Uh, so sustainability, sustainable development programs and education, they tend to be directed towards adults and it greatly uh, neglects youth. So we need to find ways um, that directly involve community participation, especially with women and girls. So as is the case with most things in life, um, with adults it's very difficult to change kind of what they've known their entire lives. But with children, if we start young, then we can you know, get them before all of the negative things have come in. Um, so with these three in mind, I asked myself, what is something that is already deeply ingrained um, in the culture of communities at both the local, national level, worldwide. What involves uh, the partici uh, participation of large numbers of youth, specifically girls, 
and at its very core is a natural driver of heritage sustainability. So what I came up with was sports. And this is a quote that I really like. Um, it frames sport as a tool for positive change, not just as a way to be physically active. Uh, so sport has become a world language, a common denominator that breaks down all the walls, all the barriers. It is a worldwide industry whose practices can have widespread impact. Most of all, it is a powerful tool for progress and for development. And does anyone here happen to know who said this? Yes. Anyone? Uh, uh, do, oh, no, even better. Uh, <laughs> UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon actually said this uh, in 2011 at the International Forum on Sport, Peace, and Development. And so over 10 millennia, um, periods of migration, conflict, modernization, natural disaster, sport has remained a constant. It's remained an integral part of the world's cultural heritage and identity. Um, but it's actually only recently that the global community has started to realize the positive impact that sport can have on society as a whole. And so most importantly, sport, it's a very low cost, high impact way to achieve development, education, and sustainability. Uh, while I won't go too into depth right now, um, I just want to briefly mention some of the many transformative values of sports. So as you can see, we have gender equality, empowerment, inclusion, participation, diversity, and tolerance. So uh, sport challenges traditional gender roles. It allows women to take back their own space in society. It empowers girls to become leaders in their communities. Uh, furthermore, these typically neglect groups um, and vulnerable, such as women, children, the disabled, indigenous communities, um, the poor, all are able to actively participate in sports. Even if some modification is involved, um, they can still be involved. And so this helps to create an environment that it doesn't only sustain human development, but also tolerant and welcoming communities. And additionally, uh, sport doesn't need to be discussed in national terms. Uh, it withstands modernization, and it is the ideal vehicle for social integration and intercultural dialogue. So here I have uh, four examples of youth-based sports development programs um, that currently exist. They, and that I believe that if UNESCO kind of molded them, took some of the concepts and molded them to their own programs, that it could be great. So these are uh, Football for Peace, this top one, and Open Football Schools. Uh, so Football for Peace, it has been very popular in bringing together Jewish and Arab communities uh, to focus on mutual understanding, uh, of course, enhancing sports skills, uh, but also instilling the participants to commit to peaceful coexistence. And the Open Fun Football Schools, it is with children and adults in conflict areas, so Bosnia, Ukraine, Iraq, all have programs, and to stimulate friendship, cooperation. This uh, America Scores, so the one on the far right, is actually, it's a program in the United States. It's in big cities, so Boston, New York, Philly. Um, it's a youth development program that they combine sports training, creative writing, entrepreneurship, and I, I personally worked with them, and it is, it is an incredible program. But my favorite is, there's one right in the middle, which is called Score the Goals. It is an educational comic book actually created by the UN Development Program. Uh, it features, you see we've got Michael Ballack in the back, we have Didier Drogba. Um, and so for some reason, the whole comic book is that they're shipwrecked on an island, and in order to get off and play this big game to raise money for the UN, they have to go through the eight Millennium Development Goals. So to get off the island. So they're walking along and find a puddle of water, and they're like, oh, we could drink this but, well, we have to make sure and filter it or boil it. But then someone says, but wait, it's stagnant water. They're mosquitoes, like we might get malaria. So it, it teaches kids and it, it's actually, it's online for free and it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> so uh, and I'm not sure if, if most people know, but uh, UNESCO is the lead agency for physical education and sport. Um, so they are uniquely positioned to not only implement heritage development programs, but also to have great success with them. Uh, so currently they provide assistance to various groups, governments, NGOs, to help develop issues relating to sport. They have also successfully piloted sports programs in El Salvador and various Western African states, mostly as a means to prevent violence, delinquency, um, to create cohesion and better cooperation. Uh, so in 1999, there was a declaration of Punta del Este and this emphasized the importance of preserving traditional and indigenous sports. 
and this actually also included the establishment of a world heritage list of traditional games and sport. So UNESCO does recognize the importance of sport, but we haven't yet harnessed its powers for kind of a greater good, I guess. So again, uh, UNESCO has noted that sport is a common identity of humanity. Um, so to end this, I haven't, this is kind of the very beginning of research, so I kind of have a few things that I would like to, I guess, focus more on. So it's kind of three main objectives. First, I want to take a look at the uh, critical correlations that exist between sport and heritage uh, and the possible impact it could have on long-term heritage sustainability in the global context. So I want to see not just how um, sport has impacted heritage and culture, but also how intangible heritage values have impacted our sports culture. Um, so again, with, with in the US, so sports culture has been sustained uh, kind of our values of victory and freedom from you know, the other. And most of the teams are actually named after certain things with our cultural heritage. So the New England Revolution, uh, the Philadelphia 76ers, so from 1776. Um, so we keep with and also to examine how um, other UN agencies, such as the UN Office on Sport for Development and Peace, have used sports-based development programs and to what extent they have. Um, so coming from this, we intend to make suggestions as to how these programs could be used to sustain intangible heritage, uh, especially with a focus on the empowerment of women and girls. And lastly, um, I aim to show that it's, at its very core, sport is a natural driver of heritage and sustainability, and there's no need to reinvent the wheel of sustainability if we can you know, integrate components of heritage with education and sport, which is arguably one of the world's most sustained it's been around for pretty much ever. So if we can kind of combine them all, then I think that it would be great. So thank you for your attention. Oh. Don't move, I hope there will be some questions.